started here today. Um, we'd just like to take a minute to welcome you guys all on the behalf of the Committee on Lectures, and we are um, funded by GSB. And before we uh, begin tonight's lectures, we'd like to thank our sponsors for tonight's lectures, um, the Department of Geological and Atmospheric Sciences, the Greenlee School of Journalism and Mass Communication, and the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Miller Fund. Um, we also hope that you guys will all stay after the reception, or stay after the lecture and join us for the reception and a book signing. And I just have to put in a, a good word about some of the wonderful lectures that we have coming up soon. Uh, Peace in Sudan, one year after the death of John Grank by Brian De Silva, will be on October 23rd at 8 in the Jardin Auditorium. A College Divided, which will be a debate between the ISU Republicans and the ISU Democrats, will be on October 26th at 7 in the sunroom. Um, Senator Joseph Biden will be October 31st at 8 in the sunroom. And starting off our November World Series is Trudy Rubin speaking on Iraq, Iran, and the fight against terrorists. And that'll be on November 1st at 8 p.m. in the sunroom. And finally, Ben Cohen, who is the co-founder of Ben & Jerry's Ice Cream, will be here on November 2nd at 8 p.m. in the sunroom slash south ballroom and there will be ice cream involved. <laughs> and now I'd like to present to you uh, Professor Jacobson, who will introduce our speaker. Yes, um, Carl Jacobson from the Department of Geological and Atmospheric Sciences. And it gives us great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Simon Winchester. Uh, it turns out that uh, our speaker will tell you a little bit about his background. And what you'll discover is that he started out in the professions as a geologist. In fact, he obtained his uh, college degree from Cambridge University. Oxford. Sorry, Oxford. I should read the notes. <laughs> At least I didn't say Iowa. Um, and uh, however, shortly after graduating, he got diverted into the field of journalism. And throughout his career as a journalist, he spent uh, most of his time working for, and I probably should read it so I don't mess this up, for The Guardian, for two English newspapers, uh, The Guardian and The Sunday Times, where he was a foreign correspondent. He spent most of his time living in uh, New York and Hong Kong, but he traveled, <laughs> traveled greatly throughout the world. And as in his career as a journalist, he covered uh, seminal events such as the Watergate affair, affair uh, the assass assassination of Egyptian President Anwar Sadat, uh, and the Falklands War, among just some of the items. Uh, and as I mentioned, he traveled extensively. He lived in many foreign countries. He traveled extensively. And this led him to develop a parallel career of writing what we might call travel books. However, travel doesn't quite encompass um, what, what these books are about. Uh, they're largely about the peoples of these countries, the culture, the history, the geography, uh, about a sense of place. And these books include ones on, on the Yangtze River in China, uh, about Korea, about Argentina, and again, many, many other places. Now, uh, along with his interests, as I've sort of hinted at, of history, uh, another one of his books, which you may know about, is A History of the Oxford English Dictionary. Now, you might not think that a book on a dictionary is going to generate a lot of interest, but in fact, this book has sold over two million copies. Uh, in more recent years, uh, he's returned to his roots of geology. In the last five years, he's published three books uh, on geology, uh, one on uh, a geologist named William Smith, which, who was the first person to create a geological map in the late, in late 1700s, early 1800s. Uh, he's also written a book on the eruption of Krakatoa, which occurred in 1883. And the last book, which will be his uh, topic tonight, is on uh, the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. Now, all these books, again, are about the geology, but they're also about the people, uh, the settlement of these areas, the culture, and the whole synthetic package. And again, the, uh, the, top, uh, the title of the talk for tonight, his last book, is A Crack in the Edge of, a world, of the World, America and the Great California Earthquake of 1906. So, Simon Winchester, please. Thank you, Carl, very much indeed. I would have been proud to have gone to the university here, so I'm sorry I went to Oxford. 
<laughs> but I thought, because a number of people have asked me how I made this translation from uh, geology into journalism, which seems a relatively non-traditional <coughs> thing to do, that I would actually start tonight before talking about San Francisco to relate that story, because it is rather a, a bizarre tale. Um, it began in 19... 19- 66, when I got a degree from Oxford, and it was a very bad degree. It was a degree which um, it's known in the trade as a Desmond. Um, that's a sort of play on words of Desmond Tutu, the South African bishop. It was a Tutu, a second class degree, and the second tier of that class. But armed with a Desmond, you can only really go into industry, you can't go into academia. And so I went to um, Uganda and worked for a Canadian mining company uh, looking for copper and I was based in the Ruanzori Mountains in, uh, on the Uganda-Congo border because I was very interested in mountaineering and I lived in a little tent in a place called Kayanjojo in the middle of nowhere and every month would go to uh, a small library in a town called Fort Portal and get whatever books I could to amuse myself during the long evening hours and most of these books were about mountaineering because it was my particular interest at the time and one day I got a book out of the library called Coronation Everest by a man called James Morris and it was the account of the climbing of Mount Everest in 1953 by the team led by John Hunt, later Lord Hunt that put Hillary and Tensing on the summit on the 29th of May 1953 and James Morris was the correspondent for the London Times newspaper and it was an extraordinary story, a very easy story to read, and, but full of excitement on two levels. It, he had never climbed a mountain before. He had never climbed a mountain. Does that mean everything I've said so far has gone unheard? <laughs> it all began in 1966. <laughs> anyway, James had never climbed, but he got up to 27,500 feet, which is a fairly creditable climb. But it was as much as anything the account of how he got the news of the success of Hillary uh, of, of um, Hillary and Tensing back to London in time to be published in the Times on the morning of the 2nd of June 1953, which was the morning of the Queen's coronation. And I remember vividly as a small boy reading the news of you know that the Queen was about to be crowned, but as a sort of jam and cream on top of this event, this last imperial hurrah, a British expedition had reached the summit of the world's highest mountain. So anyway, I read this book in Uganda and it completely transformed my life. I, it was a, a classic Pauline conversion. I decided there and then that I no longer wanted to be a geologist, which I wasn't very good at anyway. I'd love to be a, a journalist and I would love to be paid to go around the world to go to fascinating places and write stories. So I had no idea how to do this, but obviously the person to tell me would be James. So I wrote a letter that evening saying, Dear Mr. Morris, I'm a 21-year-old uh, geologist living in East Africa, and I've just read your book, and basically, uh, can I be you? <laughs> and, you know, a couple of days later, sober you know, sobriety of the morning, I realized that this was a very naive, jejeune sort of letter, and he probably wouldn't answer, but he did. He sent this incredibly helpful reply about two weeks later, saying, look, if you're serious about it, and if you think you can write, it really is the best job it's possible to have. It's a fascinating line of work. You'll get to go all over the world. You'll meet extraordinary people. You'll never make a great deal of money, but you will have a very fulfilling life. So my advice to you is quite simple. If you think you can write, then the day you receive this letter from me in Africa, resign, leave geology, immediately fly back to London and get a job on a newspaper in London and then write to me again. And I decided to do exactly that. I went into the office in Kilembe and handed in my resignation, which I'm sure they were delighted to accept, <laughs> took a car to Entebbe, flew on that night's BOAC flight back to London and arrived expecting that people would welcome me with open arms, you know, Oxford degree and all that. Well, news editors, the length and breadth of the United Kingdom, could they felt they needed me like they needed a, a heart attack. They just didn't want to know, and they sent me away, 
And so I had to get a job for six months working on an oil rig in the North Sea as a geologist, but all the time sending letters of application. And at the same time reading James Morris's books, because I knew I had no idea who James was. But when I got back to London, I realised he had written books about Venice and Spain and Oxford. He was a heavy hitter in the field of travel journalism and writing. So eventually, after about six months, a newspaper in Newcastle-upon-Tyne in the northeast of England decided to hire me. So all of a sudden, I was not a geologist, I was a reporter. And I wrote to James Morris again. He lived in a village in North Wales, and I wrote and said, I'm now a reporter, so what now? And in his reply, which I've still got, there was a sort of gulp of, you know, you took the advice? It wasn't exactly on the script. I thought you'd ignore my letter, but, well, seeing as you have, I'll give you some additional advice. Never lose your sense of wonder about the world. It's an extraordinary place. Don't get jaded. Don't get cynical. Just enjoy it. Don't bother to learn shorthand. It's a complete waste of time. Everyone in the industry will say you must. Take my advice. Ignore it. And thirdly, every month or so, package up the stories, the clippings from what you're writing, and send them down to me here in North Wales, and I will return them to you with annotations on how you could improve them. And so you can imagine, I mean, the kind of stories I was writing in those early days as a reporter were really so trivial. I mean, you know, four nuns in car crash, none hurt, that kind of thing. <laughs> Pigeon fancier loses prize bird. And, but nonetheless, I sent these down to North Wales, and back they would come with annotations saying, you know, this paragraph a little overlong, this sentence a little heavy, this verb a little infelicitously chosen. And the relationship continued like this by letter for years. I left the newspaper in Newcastle-upon-Tyne. I joined The Guardian. They sent me, first of all, for three years to Northern Ireland, and, you know, tremendously exciting, lots of stuff on the front page. And then for surviving that, the paper sent me to Washington and Nixon. We had the whole Watergate business. And so it was a very exciting time. But every month I would send my clippings to North Wales, and back they would come with annotations from James. But we never met, we never spoke, until 1974, so eight years after the relationship began. Nixon resigned, if you remember, on the 9th of August, 1974, so I covered all of that. And then, with sort of great journalistic prescience and intelligence, on the 8th of September, 1974, which was the date that President Ford pardoned Richard Nixon, I was covering Evil Knievel attempting to jump over the Snake River Canyon in Idaho, which was not a good move professionally. Anyway, I came back to Washington, which fell uncannily quiet because the story had died. Nixon was out of power. This amazingly boring President Ford was in, in office, and he had done the only thing of interest, which was to pardon his predecessor. So I decided to take a holiday, and I decided to go climbing in Britain and specifically in North Wales. So I flew over to London, rented a car, picked up an Australian friend of mine, who a reporter who worked for The Guardian, and we drove up to North Wales. And in the car on the way up, she said, doesn't your friend James Morris live in Wales? Because they, everyone on the paper knew that James had created the monster that I had turned into. And I said, yes, but we've never met. And she said, well, this is ridiculous. He'd love to meet you. So once we got to the hotel in Clamberis, we looked up his number in the telephone book and lived in a little village called Llany Stumdwy, where Lloyd George was born. And I rang, and he said, Simon, this is amazing. I mean, I read you every morning in Washington. Where are you? And I said, I'm in a hotel about five miles away from your house. When he said, well, we must meet. I mean, after all these years, I must meet. I mean, you're my protege. So it was arranged that I would go for tea the next day. So Jackie and I went climbing that day and came down from the hills about three o'clock, motored to this little village of Klanistamdui, found this beautiful country house. And there followed a moment that I will never forget, because when I looked through the glass panel of the front door, I could see acres of parquet flooring and fine oriental carpets. And we were filthy dirty because we'd been scrabbling about on the hills all day. So I rang the doorbell. And both of us were kneeling down on the front doorstep, unlacing our climbing boots. 
and the door opened and a woman appeared. And I looked up and I said, oh, hello, I'm Simon Winchester. This is Jackie Leishman. You must be Mrs. Morris. And this person said, no, I'm James, actually. And there was a moment of some slight alarm. And then I, this was the 1970s and people wore their hair rather long. So I said, oh, well, you, you never can tell these days. I'm so sorry. And then this person said, no, I'll get my wife. And I thought, no, this is some weird Welsh joke because <laughs> James Morris had climbed Everest to 27,000 feet. He'd been a captain in the Brigade of Guards. He had fathered four children. He'd walked alone across the empty quarter of Saudi Arabia. He was very much a man's man. So whoever was going to come in would be bearded with a Yukon Jack shirt or something, but not at all. In comes a middle-aged English lady with a little girl in tow, and we all go into the drawing room to have tea. And so we were sitting there with me, fairly obviously a man, and Jackie, a young woman, and Elizabeth Morris, a middle-aged lady, and Suki, a nine-year-old little girl, and James, my hero, my mentor, with all the accoutrements, and I might say very substantial accoutrements, of womanhood, sitting there in a twin set and pearls with a little you know, necklace, a little handkerchief decorously tucked into her sleeve, a tweed skirt, stockings, little court shoes. But of course, being Britain, nothing was said about this. We just <laughs> drank our tea and ate our rich tea biscuits and ignored the whole thing. And... Uh, then after a couple of hours we decided to leave and we said our farewells and Jackie being a fairly forthright Australian woman said as we left what the was all that about and I, I said I have absolutely no idea and then two days later came the letter which said dear Simon I'm so sorry to have put you through what must have been a somewhat awkward social ordeal but the fact of the matter is that I've decided to turn into a woman and I am going to Casablanca next week and if everything's successful, I will be returning as a woman and I'm going to take the name Jan Morris. And I hope you can accept this and I hope we'll be the best of friends. Well, as many of you, if you're reasonably well read, will know, Jan Morris is one of Britain's most revered and honoured writers. And she was 80 last week and I was at her birthday party. We've written a book together on British architecture in India and we are... I won't exactly say bosom buddies, but we're, <laughs> we are very, very great friends. She still lives with Elizabeth. They are, English law is not quite as progressive as in some parts of the United States, so they can no longer be married. So they live together as sisters-in-law. They're still very much in love. And the situation is entirely happy. So it's a rather peculiar mentoring process. And I must say, for many years immediately after this revelation... I would check myself in the shower to make sure that the mentoring hadn't gone too far, and I'm <laughs> relieved to say that it hadn't. But I'm mentioning this today, one, to answer the question that one or two people put to me at dinner tonight, but mainly because Jan Morris, a towering force in my life, is now 80 years old. So please go and read her books. She's a wonderful, wonderful person and changed my life almost as radically as she changed her own. <laughs> so... Now to talk to the business of the evening, which is San Francisco. Um, I'm not going to talk an awful lot about the earthquake itself, because I think that story is very well known. I will talk a bit about it, though. But I want to talk about it, why I became interested in the story and why I think it is a hugely important event in American history and in scientific history. But first of all, San Francisco itself. I think what strikes any English person, any person from Europe is how, how young a city it is. I mean, this is a city founded almost yesterday, it seems. I mean, 1839, the first settler, who was an Englishman called Richardson, who lived there on his own for six years, selling tallow. It must have been a monstrously dull life, living in the fog and cold of San Francisco Bay, buying tallow from the local Miwok Indians and then selling it on to passing ships. So he did this for six years, and then after six years he was joined by someone else. And then a woman came, and then a baby was born, and then they had a block party. <laughs> and by about 1842 it was a little village, and probably would have remained a little village, but for the event that of course all Americans have 
riven into their brains, which was the discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill, and then suddenly San Francisco changed. It went from being, people say that it was a, a city that was never a town. It went from being a village to being a city almost overnight, because the moment that gold was discovered, people poured in from mainly the east of the United States, poured in either overland, these terribly difficult journeys across the entirety of the continent, or across the Isthmus of Panama, or more dangerously of all, of course, going the long sea route round Cape Horn. And by their thousands, they came to San Francisco Bay. Most of them, it had to be said, men. Men who had uprooted themselves from their families and decided to come and look for gold in the Sierra on their own. And they, not unreasonably, were joined by thousands of women of somewhat flexible moral character who poured in from other parts of the United States or from south of the border to amuse a company and otherwise titillate them. And this gave the city of San Francisco a reputation which it really never lost of being a center of licentiousness and amusement, of bawdiness, of, of fun. I mean, it was a, full of bars and burlesque houses and strip clubs and brothels and things like that. My favorite building of all, uh, sadly it was destroyed in 1906, was the 1,000-room Hotel Nymphomania, which I would love to see rebuilt in San Francisco, <laughs> in a most amusing place. The city would have remained more or less like that, I think, had not the United States government decided in towards the end of the century that because it was the biggest commercial center on the West Coast, so it had to be given an aura of respectability. So it had to be the headquarters, the natural headquarters, for a number of major organizations of state. And so suddenly, there were big banks built there, big insurance houses, courthouses, federal courthouses, a mint to print American money. And there were great buildings of the kind of thing that you didn't see anywhere else in the United States except perhaps in Washington and New York and Philadelphia built on top of this somewhat seedy um, city of burlesque houses and brothels. And so buildings were put up with marble facades and gold domes and caryatids and pillars. And this architectural dichotomy was reflected by the people that lived there and the amusements that entertained them at the beginning of the last century, the beginning of the century in which the city was destroyed by the earthquake. And on the night before the earthquake, Tuesday the 17th of April 1906, if you just look in the daily paper to see what amusements were available for the population, the dichotomy is very evident because, yes, there were burlesque houses and, yes, there were, you know, kind of vaudeville plays and there was a ice skating derby and a roller derby and the music halls and the bars were advertising you know, special singers from Nevada and so forth. But also, uh, the, the New York Opera was in town. Enrico Caruso was there singing Carmen. John Barrymore, the actor. So there was great distinction, great cultural distinction and low life taking place in San Francisco on that evening. I'm going to read you two very short chunks of the book just to try and sort of paint a picture of what happened on those two days, the day before the earthquake and the day of the earthquake. The sun was due to come up that Wednesday at 5.31 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. The sky had begun to lighten about 15 minutes before five, and by the time the bells of old St. Mary's Church in Chinatown had pealed the hour, all of the sky beyond the hills of Oakland and Livermore was lightening fast, limbed, with the palest, clearest eggshell blue. The gas lights that had illuminated the deserted streets dimmed and were snuffed out with faint popping sounds at eight minutes past five. At about the same time, an unseen hand in a faraway engine house turned a crank and threw a giant lever, and huge drums began to roll. And so began the clanking grind of steel, steel rope, and ever-turning steel wheels that was then and is now one of San Francisco's most haunting and evocative sounds. The cable car lines were running, and one by one their carriages rumbled out of their barns, ready to haul passengers up and over the city's innumerable hills. And also one by one people, men by and large, began to appear in the still half-dark streets, 
These were either early starters idling their sleepy way to their offices or shops, or night shift workers heading wearily back home. The smell of baking bread mingled with coffee was in the air, as was the smoke of early cooking fires. The blue-uniformed policemen, slow and imperturbable, patrolled their allotted beats. The breeze was westerly, but light. Dawn was unfolding quietly, serenely. All was perfect peace. Well, that peace, as you all know, was horrifically interrupted at 12 minutes past five that morning, when there was beneath the sea, a few miles off where is now the Golden Gate Bridge, a sudden rupture took place a few miles below the seabed. And this caused a tremendous shuddering which lasted for about 50 seconds and completely changed everything in and around San Francisco. The first man that we know experienced it was uh, a man called Judson, Clarence Judson, who lived in the far west of San Francisco where there were many sand dunes and which is now populated largely by Chinese people. He used to go from his home on 47th Avenue to swim on Ocean Beach and that morning he got up as usual at five and walked over to the beach, took off his dressing gown, his robe and his, laid his slippers down and went out into the sea. And he said, when he remembered that day, that the sea seemed unusually confused that morning. People have peculiar memories in moments of catastrophe and there's no other evidence that the sea didn't actually look exactly as normal. But anyway, he said it, there was something ominous about it. I doubt it, but that's what he said. He went out into the sea and started swimming fairly close to shore. He was a strong swimmer when suddenly there was this huge rumbling roar and he was knocked off his feet by an enormous wave which just came out of nowhere. And he suddenly found that his feet were swept away, that the, the sand beneath his feet, there wasn't any. There was a great chasm beneath his feet. And he was briefly frightened because the sea did suddenly become, become tumultuous, full of turmoil. And he decided he must go into shore, so he tried to strike out for shore, but every time he tried to put his feet down, the sand rose and fell beneath them, and, and he was in deep water and then shallow water, and there were more waves and this terrible roaring sound which kept knocking him down, and eventually, eventually he did make it into shallow water and started crawling on his hands and knees through this maelstrom of water up towards where he had left his robe and his slippers. But the sand was rising and falling and rocking back and forth and there was this continu continuous roaring sound. He finally got to his dressing gown and just lay flat on it while the earth went mad for, a, he said, about two minutes, but we think it was probably about 50 seconds. So he's the first person that we know definitely experienced it. At the other side, if you think of San Francisco as being like a thumb, he was on the western side of the thumb. On the eastern side, on the San Francisco Bay side, he, he was on the ocean side. It was a few seconds later, we think, that it was experienced. And the first one to notice it was a, a policeman, an Inspector Walsh, who was on the Embarcadero end of Washington Street, which is one of the few streets that goes essentially all the way across San Francisco, east to west from the Embarcadero, to the ocean. He was checking the locks of some warehouses when suddenly, 12 minutes past five, he noted in his notebook later, there was this deep-throated roaring sound. And he looked up. The noise seemed to be coming from the west, seemed to be coming from where Clarence Judson had had that experience. And he was horrified to see Washington Street, which goes straight up a hill and down the other side, suddenly seeming to look like giant waves. It was rippling. The whole concrete and paving stones and cobblestones were rising and falling, and the buildings, the skyscrapers, many of them these impressive buildings that had been put there essentially at the behest of the federal government, started rocking back and forth in, the, in his direction, west, east, west, east. And as they did so, and as the rocking intensified, so pieces of them started falling off, these ornamental pieces that had been put there deliberately to make these buildings look more extravagant and impressive. So domes and cupolas and caryatids and columns and stained glass windows started breaking loose from the buildings and crashing down into the ground. And at the same time, there were hundreds and hundreds of 
brick chimneys all over San Francisco and they collapsed within seconds because brick structures are very, very vulnerable to earthquakes. And then had he known what a zip fastener was, I'm sure he would have described the sound of what then happened to Washington Street as being like a zip fastener because it ripped open along the cobblestones, along the join between some of the cobbles and a great big chasm appeared going all the way up the hill along Washington Street. And then a number of things happened simultaneously. As the street ripped apart, so all the gas mains that were underneath the roadway, the gas mains that were supplying the gas lamps, broke. And huge fountains of white gas started pouring out into the street. At the same time as that happened, the electrical wires that festooned the lower part of San Francisco which were on wooden poles. The poles broke, the cables fell to the ground, and they were like snakes arcing every time they made contact with one another. And the sparks inevitably, as well as the sparks from the downed chimneys, set fire to the gas. And so within a minute of this tremendous, frightening event, fires started breaking out simultaneously all up and down Washington Street, but all to his left and right, and the third thing that happened, and most ominously of all, really, I suppose, was that as the gas pipes broke, so did the water mains broke. But the difference was that as the water mains under the road broke and huge eruptions of water started pouring out into the street, while the gas kept running, the water abated within a few seconds because all the water storage tanks ran out of water. There was much more gas available than there was water. And this meant, of course, ominously for the city, that there was all of a sudden no water with which to start attacking the fires. And that, of course, was what was really sounded the death knell for the city because these fires spread furiously all over the town and the buildings that hadn't been destroyed by the shaking were destroyed by the burning. And many people for a long, long time referred to the event as being the great San Francisco fire of 1906, to the chagrin of the geological community that said it was actually the earthquake that started the whole thing off. But that's an entirely different debate. Now, I could have spent the whole book devoting myself to the eyewitness accounts of people, people like Ansel Adams, who was, I think, four years old at the time. He broke his nose in the San Francisco earthquake. If you look at pictures of Ansel Adams, you'll see he's got this beak-shaped proboscis with a big lump on the top of it. That was caused by... he and he was hit by a brick in the garden of his house in San Francisco. Well, I could have written a book entirely devoted to these eyewitness accounts, of which there are thousands. But I decided not to, because I was interested in the earthquake for different reasons, as I'll explain. But there were so many bizarre things that happened that I think just to further offer some of the atmosphere, I'll read you one short account of something that happened which you wouldn't normally expect. This was another policeman's account of seeing something a few minutes after the shaking had stopped. What he saw next was memorably awful. A stampede of wild, long-horned cattle tearing towards him along Mission Street from the direction of the docks. It turned out later that a group of Mexican vaqueros had unloaded these beef cattle from an inbound ship and were driving them to the city stockyards in the south of town. The moment the shocks began, the drivers took off, leaving the herd to fend for itself, and as the policeman put it, the cattle promptly went daft with terror and started running anywhere. And he continued, While a lot of them were running along the sidewalks of Mission Street between Fremont and First Streets, a big warehouse toppled onto the thoroughfare and crushed most of them clean through the pavement into the basement, killing them and burying them outright. The first that I saw of the bunch were caught and crippled by falling cornices or the like, and they were in great misery. So I took out my gun and shot them. Then I only had six shots left, and I saw that more cattle were coming along and that there was going to be big trouble. At that moment I ran into John Moller, who owned the saloon. I asked him if he had any ammunition in his place, and if so, to let me have some, quick. He was very scared and excited over the earthquake and everything, and when he saw the cattle coming along, charging and charging and bellowing, he seemed to lose more nerve. Anyway, there was no time to think. Two of the steers were charging right at us while I, he, I was asking him to help, and he started to run for his saloon. I had to be quick about my part of the job, because with only a revolver as a weapon, 
I had to wait until the animal was quite close before I dared to fire, otherwise I wouldn't have killed or even have stopped him. As I shot down one of them, I saw the other charging after John Moller, who was then at the door of his saloon and apparently quite safe. But as I was looking at him and at the steer, Moller turned and seemed to become paralysed with fear. He held out both hands as if beseeching the beast to go back, but it charged on and ripped him before I could get near enough to fire. And when I killed the animal, it was too late to save the man. Then a young fellow came running up carrying a rifle and a lot of cartridges. It was an old Springfield and he knew how to use it. He was a cool shot and he understood cattle too. He told me later he came from Texas. We probably killed 50 or 60. We used the rifle alternately, the Texan and myself. So all kinds of mayhem of one sort or another. By the time the dust cleared, the casualty numbers were a little bit difficult to discern. Only about 700 were known to have been killed. A quarter of a million people were made homeless. They've done a recount recently, which they, a woman called Gladys Hansen published on the anniversary of the centenary last April the 18th, and she now thinks 6,000 were killed. Not compared to, for instance, the great tsunami of two years ago, a massive, massive earthquake. But nonetheless, for reasons I'll try to explain now, a symbolically and scientifically hugely important earthquake. Before I talk about the, the aftermath, which is what interests me most of all, I do want to talk a little about the relief operations that occurred immediately after the earthquake, because when I was writing this book, Katrina happened, and it was very interesting to compare the response of the authorities in San Francisco in 1906 to the response of the authorities in New Orleans 99 years later. And it has to be said that the response in 1906 was infinitely better, infinitely more efficient than what occurred under the superintendency of that Mr. Brown, who, as you will probably remember, his only previous experience was limited to looking after the legal affairs of Arabian horses, I think. He was clearly not the most capable man to manage that, and it shows very much in comparing the two events. What happened immediately after the earthquake in 1906 has a lot to do with the army, the American army's response. The commander of the American army in San Francisco in 1906 was a very interesting man who I was actually a long time ago wanting to write a book about. He was called Adolphus Washington Greeley. And he was a hero in many, many ways. He was one of the founders of the National Geographic magazine. He had suffered through a terribly disastrous expedition to Ellesmere Island in northern Canada on a geological expedition in the 1890s. And he was made commander of the garrison, a very substantial garrison in San Francisco. But unfortunately, he is entirely irrelevant to this story because at the time of the earthquake, he was in Chicago attending his daughter's wedding. And it was left to his deputy, a man called Frederick Funston, to manage what then happened. Now, Funston was not a good man. He was, in fact, a thoroughly bad hat. He had been a brigadier in the American army in the Philippines and had done some pretty frightful things there. There were all sorts of tales of you know, taking no prisoners policy. He was extremely racist and cruel and unpleasant. And he was brought back to the United States essentially to be cashiered and probably dismissed, but he managed to talk his superiors at the Pentagon, as well, not the Pentagon, but the Department of War, to allow him to stay in the American army. And then briefly, and some of you might think some perhaps characteristically, after a life of villainy, he decided he'd have a go at entering American politics and <laughs> made a number of speeches in the hope of becoming a Republican congressman. But he was accused by the newspapers of doing these various things in the Philippines and decided he better withdraw his candidacy. So he went back to the army and they posted him somewhat humiliatingly for him, but deservedly, to be the number two in San Francisco. Not exactly a great job after being the commander in the Philippines. So he took over and was there when the earthquake struck at 12 minutes past five on that morning of April the 18th. He was bounced out of his bed like everybody else, but he responded brilliantly. He, and the, the classic example of there comes a tide in the affairs of man which taken on the flood leads on to greatness because he made decisions which in retrospect were entirely right. 
he decided that the first thing that needed to be done was that discipline and order had to be brought to the city and confidence had to be shown to a populace who were bewildered and frightened and didn't know what was happening. So he found a man on a horse, wrote a hurried message to his adjutant down at the Presidio where the soldiers were based, told the man to gallop down the hill to the Presidio and order up as many soldiers as could possibly be found to march in full battle dress with rifles, with fixed bayonets, into the city of San Francisco and present themselves to the mayor of San Francisco for his disposal. Completely illegal order. I mean, you cannot willy-nilly hand over federal troops at your own behest to give them to the mayor of an American city to do whatever he will. But this was the decision that Funston took. And so, one hour and 45 minutes after the earthquake struck, a full battalion of American soldiers were marching in full battle dress up the hills into the city, bayonets gleaming, ammunition in their pouches, showing to the citizenry, who were bewildered and frightened mm -hmm. as they wheeled round the ruins and past the fires, that America was taking this seriously, that the federal government was taking charge. The soldiers presented themselves by about 8.30 to the mayor, a mayor in equally unprepossessing character, a villain too. I mean, San Francisco in 1906 was, was a sink of corruption and iniquity. And Eugene Schmitz, who was the mayor, was a thorough villain. He was a, a violinist in a jazz band who was just a sort of placeman for a very corrupt uh, person called Abraham Roof. But he too rose to the occasion. He saw these soldiers and said, right, I can make use of these soldiers for a start. Looting is breaking out in San Francisco. I will order these soldiers to shoot, to kill anyone that they see looting. He promulgated an order immediately. Anyone that was caught looting would be shot dead. Totally illegal order. I mean, essentially declaring martial law in San Francisco, which a mayor has no authority to do, certainly not with federal troops. But it had the desired effect. After 11 o'clock, all the looting stopped. Order was returned in double quick time. He also had no knowledge whatsoever of how to fight fires, but he realized that fires were going to be a major problem. Dennis Sullivan, the fire chief, had been killed by the earthquake, so not only was the fire department of the city leaderless, it was also waterless. So he reasoned, how a violinist knows these things I don't know, but he did, that to stop the fire spreading you had to create fire breaks. Fire breaks in urban situations can be created only by buildings being blown up. Soldiers have access to things that blow up, gunpowder and dynamite, cordite and shells. So he sent the, some of the soldiers back to get as much dynamite as they could possibly lay their hands on and began blowing up buildings. Some people say to this day he blew up too many buildings and that he did more damage to San Francisco than perhaps it might, but nonetheless, and that's an argument which fire chiefs debate to this day, but he took action. And he did another thing too, tremendously important. All the telegraph lines in the city were down. America didn't know what had happened to this city. He said there must be telegraph lines working in Oakland, so he commandeered a boat, wrote a message to the telegraph chief over in Oakland, and at 11.15, a message went out over the telegraph saying, San Francisco has been hit by an almighty earthquake. Hundreds are dead, thousands are homeless, we need help. That was received in the White House at 2.30 Eastern time that same day. Teddy Roosevelt was in charge in the White House. William Taft was the Secretary of War. Both responded with astonishing energy and alacrity and efficiency. Congress was called into emergency session and, and sat till 4.30 that next morning, passing all the necessary enabling legislation for money in whatever quantities were necessary to be given to San Francisco to the relief operation. Five military relief trains were sent that day, including the longest train, hospital train ever assembled in America, pounding their way west towards the Rocky Mountains. The first relief train arrived on federal orders in San Francisco from Los Angeles that very night, just before midnight. By the end of that week, every single tent in the possession of the American army was in San Francisco, pitched and providing emergency housing for the 250,000 people who had lost their houses. Within 10 days, one in 10 of the entire American standing army was on duty in San Francisco, 
helping with the relief operations. The federal response was astonishing in its speed and generosity and efficiency. And although all the plaudits, I think, belong deservedly to the big organs of state, I think the lesser and the forgotten bureaucrats also did sterling service. And the one I like to remember most of all is the postmaster from San Francisco, an unsung figure who, but for this one decision, no one would ever have remembered him. He was called William Fisk. And he decided that what the people needed more than anything, now they had got food and shelter, was to tell their loved ones of their condition, because people would be worrying. And he had got some elements of the post office system back working. But he said, many of these people have no access to money, they can't find stamps, but they need to get their messages out. So he promulgated an order, totally illegal once again, he didn't bother to ask anyone back in headquarters in Washington, saying the order he put out said that no card or letter written in the hand of a victim of this earthquake shall go undelivered for want of fee. And anyone, in other words, who put a letter without a stamp on it, it would still be delivered and the news of what had happened to the city would still be transmitted to loved ones all over America. And so it was. Now compare that in an age without cell phones, without satellite television, without any warning, because no one knew that this earthquake was going to hit San Francisco, whereas everyone knew that Katrina was roaring its way towards the city of New Orleans. Compare that in 1906 with what happened 99 years later and consider which was the better response. I think it's, it's a no-brainer, as you say over here. Far better response. However... That's not really what I'm here to talk about. It was just a happy or unhappy coincidence that Katrina happened. What interested me really about this event was that it represented a major, major shift in the way that humankind came to deal intellectually with major natural catastrophes. Up until the moment of this earthquake, most people in the world believed that major, major natural catastrophes were the work of God, were the work of an angry and capricious deity. A classic example of this is the 1755 earthquake that destroyed the city of Lisbon in Portugal. A catastrophic event, Lisbon was essentially levelled, and everyone, with the single exception of Voltaire, who in Candide offers a rational explanation for what happened, everyone else said that this was the work of an angry god. And the administration of the city of Lisbon, once it picked itself up, did what people in those days did to placate the deity. They rounded up all the local heretics and they burned them. Now it has to be said there has not been an earthquake in Lisbon since. <laughs> I'm entirely in favour of burning heretics whenever I see them. And it seems to be efficacious, seismologically efficacious way of preventing earthquakes. Something to bear in mind, perhaps, in this country. That attitude hadn't changed 150, 130 years later when we saw the eruption of Krakatoa, which was the, the book I did previous to San Francisco. Here you have an enormous volcano west of Java, not as the famous or infamous film Krakatoa, east of Java has it. Krakatoa east of Java was derided by the New York Times which said in 1963 when it was first issued this is one of the worst films we have ever seen and its badness begins with its title Krakatoa east of Java because in fact Krakatoa is west of Java as indeed it is. It lies in the strait between the islands of Sumatra and Java and when at two minutes past ten on the 27th of August 1883 it erupted it caused enormous de devastation to the coastal villages and towns particularly in Java but in Sumatra too. It caused a tsunami far more lethal than any up to that moment and only exceeded in lethality by the one that occurred two years ago south of uh, Sumatra. 40,000 people were killed. Villages were devastated. Agriculture was ruined. Railway lines torn up. There was major, major devastation, and the whole world was affected by the dust clouds and so on and so forth. The locals believed, almost to a man, that this was the work 
of an angry deity, much as the people had done in Lisbon. But of course a different deity, because Java and Sumatra in 1883 were overwhelmingly Islamic. And the local mullah, the local, the ayatollah, if one might call him, a chap called Abdul Karim, immediately said this was the work of Allah, who is angry. And he came up very quickly with a reason for them, for him to be angry. It's because you craven Javanese and Sumatrans are allowing yourselves to be ruled by white, Western, Christian, infidel, Dutch imperialists. Rise up and kill them to placate Allah. And so they did within two days of the volcano. Young, fundamentalist, Islamic Javanese armed with daggers fell upon Dutch soldiers and stabbed them. None were killed. They did this under the banner of Krakatoa until Abdul Karim said, no, no, we mustn't do this in a piecemeal fashion. Krakatoa is a God-given opportunity to do this in an organized fashion. We'll organize a rebellion. And five years later, under the banner once again of Krakatoa, there was what's called the Great Banten Rebellion of 1888, where thousands of young fundamentalist Muslim Javanese armed to the teeth, the first, as it were, fundamentalist Muslim army of modern times, fell upon Dutch soldiers and agriculturalists and bureaucrats and their wives and children and killed scores of them. And the Dutch government, the colonial power at the time, did what Western governments do to this very day. They assembled an enormous army, moved into West Java, put down the rebellion, neutralized, captured, interrogated, tortured and killed the leaders and the rebellion seemed to stop. But of course it didn't stop, because these things don't stop quite so easily as we're seeing so tragically today. The great Banten Rebellion of 1888, under the watchword of Krakatoa, was really the beginning of the end of Dutch imperial rule in what were the Dutch East Indies, and the beginning of the beginning of the creation of what is that still the most populous Islamic state on earth, the Republic of Indonesia. So great natural events can have a long, long shadow cast after them which may have political or religious implications. Much the same thing happened, and one can be facetious or mischievous and suggest that the political implications of San Francisco are with us today because there was an almighty religious reaction to San Francisco. Let me try and explain. In 1902, a church was inaugurated in Kansas, in Topeka, by a fiery evangelical preacher who spoke the word of God in such a dramatic, ostentatious way that people in the congregation were profoundly affected. Some of the people began to perform curious sort of gymnastic gyrations in the aisle of the church, the holy rollers, as they've, they've been come to know. Others mysteriously, miraculously, some might say, began to speak in tongues, particularly in languages that, of which they had hitherto had no familiarity at all. People in Topeka would suddenly start speaking in Iranian or Chinese or Lithuanian. And this was taken, these two events, people speaking in tongues or gyrating wildly in the aisle of the church as manifestations of God's power. These churches spread from Kansas to Nebraska, down south into North Texas, Oklahoma. They didn't spread into the somewhat more religiously skeptical east of the United States, but they did spread west. And so you see in 1904, churches in New Mexico and Arizona, 1905 in Utah, and 1906 in California. Not in the north, but in southern California. And specifically, the first of these churches in the small city, 40,000 people only in those days, the small city of Los Angeles. The first of these churches opened in a street called Azusa Street. And to this day, the Azusa Street Revival is a very important way station in the history of fundamentalist Christianity in this country. Specifically, this church opened for business on Sunday, the 15th of April, 1906 under a pastor, a fiery Texan pastor, called the Reverend Thomas Parham. And he stood up 
in his pulpit and made a particularly fiery speech and people on cue started falling about in the aisles and speaking in Bulgarian and Mandarin Chinese or whatever and this was taken as a sign from the Lord but said the pastor you may think this is extraordinary but I promise you that in a few days there will be a major manifestation of the Lord's word somewhere nearby something is going to happen which will show any skeptics that the Lord is with us this would have passed unnoticed except that there was a reporter in church that day from the Los Angeles Times and if you look in the paper of Monday the 16th of April 1906 there's a small inside page story pastor predicts major sign from God due any day Two days later, the most sinful city in all of America, <laughs> the city which housed the Hotel Nymphomania, was destroyed in 50 seconds of violent ground shaking. The following Sunday, 10,000 people turned up to hear Reverend Parham with a somewhat <laughs> smug smile on his face preach in Azusa Street, saying essentially there, I told you so. And with that, began the Azusa Street Revival, and with the Azusa Street Revival came the birth of the Pentecostalist Church in the United States, a church which is still with us today, and which has given us such intellectual luminaries and giants of religion as the Reverend Jimmy Swaggart, Tammy Faye Baker, Pat Robertson, people whose political impact in this country is very large indeed. And so one can say, if one's mischievous and foreign, and if one has a green card and can't now be thrown out of this country, that <laughs> we may blame the existence of President Bush on what happened in San Francisco in 1906. The long tendrils of major seismic events are still with us today in the White House. However, and it's a very important however, for the first time, with the San Francisco earthquake, the principal effect of the earthquake was not religious. It had been in 1755, Lisbon. It had been in 1883, Krakatoa. But in San Francisco in 1906, although there was this hugely important religious reaction, the principal reaction was a rational reaction. For the first time ever, people said this was not an act of God. This was an act of nature. And it is our duty as rational human beings to try and find out what caused it. So two days after the earthquake, the somewhat dull Republican dentist, Governor Pardee, who ran the state, ordered a commission to be established to investigate the causes. What natural event lay behind this frightening 50 seconds of shaking which destroyed the greatest city in the American West? And he appointed a geologist, a geophysicist named Andrew Lawson, who then got together a group of the finest geologists in the land to investigate what had happened. And their report, which came out in 1908, a big, thick, red, leather-bound book, remains biblical in its authority, if I can use that, having said what I've said, on early geology and early seismic understanding of America. And there are many, many things that Lawson and his team discovered. But the one thing with which I think this audience will be familiar it was a very simple discovery he made. He decided he would plot on a map the places in and around San Francisco where there had been the greatest amount of ground displacement. You'll know that in one little town about 20 miles north of San Francisco, there's a farmer's fence which, has been, which was broken by the ground shock and moved 21 and a half feet. The earth had moved seven yards, which is an enormous amount of ground displacement. So he decided to look at all the ground displacements and plot on a map where they had occurred. And he found that the greatest ground displacements, five feet here, seven feet there, nine feet there, three feet there, occurred in an uncannily straight line in a valley just to the south of the city of San Francisco, a valley which contained a river and a small lake and which had been discovered in 1757 by a Spanish explorer discovered on the 30th of November, 1757. And because that was the Feast of St. Andrew, the name of that valley was the Valle de San Andreas. And so Andrew Lawson decided that what he was seeing with this ground displacement was a fault in the surface of the earth. And because of this valley, he would call it the San Andreas Fault. 
and he plotted this line for 700 miles from where the fault evidently originated in Humboldt County, County north of, in the north of California, all the way down through San Francisco, through the Central Valley, to the mountains north of Los Angeles, down through Palm Springs and Palm Desert, Dings and Palm Desert, Dings and Palm Desert, Dings and Palm Desert, 